<coughs> okay. So let me introduce the first uh, speaker teacher for today. Uh, this is Professor Ugo Catelli, and he will speak about the introduction to game theory and the application to extra exoplanetary systems. And uh, the course will be two hours uh, and uh, without the Well, <clears throat> as you can see, uh, most of the work has been done in collaboration with uh, Chiara Caraccio, Marco Sansotta, and Mada Volpi, in alphabetical order. And, uh, well, uh, now I'm commenting the, the, the dots on the top of the slide. Well, uh, there is a lot of people scared about the quantity of the dots, hmm? okay? But believe me that most of the dots are actually a, 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 a small variation of the, the receiving dots, so it's a sort of animation of videos or slides that are similar. But what I really know exactly how to fit with this strange format that is something in between uh, in between uh, a, a sort of a long seminar and a lecture so I told uh, I thought that it could be useful to make a sort of uh, lecture actually for uh, half uh, of this uh, lecture or talk, and uh, uh, at the end, uh, I will try to sell our fish in the sense to be trying to communicate what uh, we are really doing uh, in the uh, right now as a line of research, also because that is a, a contribution in the green. So I Well, so, and in particular, uh, for what concerns the application, let me say that I started to work uh, on exoplanetary systems uh, just because of Mata, involved mainly in the, in the topics, and while well, I cannot do anything without Marco, so this is the reason he is appearing here, and uh, more recently, uh, the two PhD students I am following in this period, so Chiara, uh, gave a, an important contribution and <coughs> basically all the computations we, you will see uh, have, been done, uh, have been done by her. Well, so let's start. So it is a, an introduction to KM theory, so the first thing to a clear in mind is the statement of the KM theory. Okay, most of you know very well. This is the version uh, <coughs> given originally by Kolmogorov in a very short article. It was a six pages article, very dense. Well, without the proof except the scheme of the proof. And as Antonio told me, many times, well, it was a clear scheme of the proof that can be converted in a complete proof by a good student. Well, let me add a very good student. Okay. Anyway, the, the, the scheme was clear. So, the statement is in this form. You have a quasi-integrable Hamiltonian so quasi-integrable means that, okay, you have a part that is dependent just by the actions, and then by the Hilbert theorem, this part is integrable. Plus epsilon, epsilon is a, a small parameter, times a, a perturbation that is uh, uh, dependent both on uh, actions and on angles. So a priori, it is not integrable. 
So uh, let's assume that the Antonio is analytic. Let's assume that you are focusing on, uh, <clears throat> on a specific invariant torus for the so-called integrable approximation. So when you have epsilon equal to zero, so you focus on the torus corresponding to p equal to zero. And if you remove epsilon, you put p equal to zero in the equations of motion, then you have a, uh, an invariant torus of p equal to zero that is traveled by quasi-periodic motions or with angular velocity that is equal to omega. And for that, you assume a non-resonant, a strong non-resonant condition that is very confined. Very confined. Very confined. Uh, <clears throat> then you assume that the Hamiltonian is non-degenerate for the integrable part. It means that, okay, uh, the, in mathematical terms, uh, <clears throat> the gradient of the Hamiltonian with respect to the actions is uh, well established a one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between angular velocities on the tori creating the uh, base space for the integral approximation and the action itself. Themselves. Okay. Then epsilon must be a small enough parameter. Okay. In this case, you have uh, a canonic, a single canonical transformation uh, that maps uh, your original uh, um, coordinates in other coordinates, no, so called normalized, where uh, you have uh, uh, the Hamiltonian that is in Kolmogorov normal form. It means that you have the linear part that is similar, linear part with respect to the action, that is similar to what you had before, uh, and there you have not the dependence on the angles. You have the dependence on, on the angles in the remainder that is at least quadratic with respect to Okay, so in order to visualize the content of uh, uh, the theorem, okay, <clears throat> let me cheat a bit. Well, this is uh, a phase portrait of the standard map. So it is not a continuous flow, but it is the most comfortable way to visualize a, a, a dynamical behavior. So in the case uh, you have epsilon equal to zero, you have many <coughs> invariant curves, okay? Uh, here I have plotted uh, some initial conditions and most of them correspond to periodic orbits, okay? Except uh, two curves in bold that when you switch on the perturbation are transformed to that invariant curve. Well, in which sense? In the sense that uh, the frequency of the motion here is the same as the frequency here. In which sense again? In the sense that if you do a Fourier uh, transform of the motion, you see that the main frequency, that the motion is quasi-periodic, and the main frequency uh, actually, the frequency vector is omega. Okay, and uh, if I remember well, this is corresponding to the frequency square root of 2 uh, and 1 uh, is the other entry of the vector frequencies, and this is for the coordinate. Okay, well, you see the, the phase port that we will add is rather rich, you have chaos and so on and so forth periodic orbits, chain of resonant ions, and so on and so forth. Okay, what? Uh, a, a last comment about the uh, canonical formalism. When you have a canonical transformation, uh, what makes you very happy is that
that motions are transforming in motion. So frequency of motion. So a solution in the normalized coordinates, and if you <laughs> if you break down the Hamilton equation for uh, uh, capital P equal to zero, it is very easy to uh, to solve the equation of motion. Well, uh, that solution that is a game of this type in the normalized coordinates is mapped backwards in the old coordinates, okay, by distorting a bit the form of the imbalance function. And this is the, the very common behavior, okay, and this uh, this canonical transformation, labeled by Epsilon, is of course near to the limit. Okay, let me rephrase a bit the statement in this way. And uh, what I've done it uh, for pedagogical reasons, because uh, you'll see more and more to disappear a hypothesis in the statements. The game theory, I'll, uh, I'll show to you. I, I'm not do any proof about KM theorem, okay, because that was some time, okay, but I'll extract what is most useful, in my personal opinion, to implement application. So, well, uh, if you compare this statement with this other statement that actually is what uh, it was also in the paper of Kolmogor as a sort of corollary after the remark that um, diophantine uh, vectors have uh, full measure in uh, the real vectors. Okay, so most uh, well say the complementary of diophantine vectors have uh, uh, Lebesgue measure equal to zero. Well, uh, what is disappeared is uh, the assumption that uh, the um, invariant topos must have diophantine uh, a, a diophantine uh, frequency. Why that? Because, well, uh, uh, since uh, the um, integrable approximation is uh, non degenerate, then you can always shift a bit the origin of the actions in order to focus on P equal zero. Well, actually, we find equal to zero. Mm. Uh, that is corresponding to again a non resonant linear uh, invariant topos. Okay? And then, uh, well, using uh, uh, this uh, <coughs> result about the measure of the diophantine vectors, well, you are right to state that you have not just one single torus, but plenty of tori, okay, that are surviving uh, the, uh, that are persisting under perturbation if the perturbation is not enough. Well, another uh, uh, remark about um, the hypothesis, okay, all the hypothesis in the statement I've been with, I think just do some uh, short remarks about that. So uh, there are KM groups for no resonant conditions that are weaker than the diophantine one, for instance with Bruno numbers or Bruno vectors. Uh, you can uh, get the KM theorem also in cases where you have partial degeneracies of, uh, of the integrable approximation 
and uh, you can, well, even Musa, so in the 62, gave a, a proof of the theorem for symplectic maps, uh, where uh, the analyticity was not required. And about the smallness, well, at the beginning, the threshold of applicability was extremely low, but part working both on the proof and also implementing the proof in a computer-aided context, uh, you can uh, <coughs> increase a lot the uh, so-called breakdown threshold of applicability of the theory. Okay, but I like to work with uh, such a strong hypothesis. Okay, because I'm interested in applications where usually this hypothesis is uh, uh, satisfied. Well, so let's go in the direction of extracting information from the uh, proof of the KM theorem. So let me recall the definition of the Poisson bucket. And uh, there is a very important tool uh, we have used to work with, and this tool is uh, uh, the um, possibility to perform canonical transformations that are near to the identity in general by this series. Okay, and uh, it's a machinery that may be at the first uh, the first time you you touch it, uh, it can. Uh, look a bit complicated, but in this slide I try to give you the shortest way to introduce this transformation. So, uh, first let me remind you that a canonical flow um, induces a uh, canonical transformation. So, the flow induced by an initial, okay? And there is also a proof on this. This is probably the only proof we have seen, okay? And then, uh, mind the fact that the evolution of any dynamical function, what a dynamical function is. A dynamical function is just a function defined on the base space, okay? So, on coordinates and momenta defined in the series. Okay? And the dynamical evolution is expressed by a Poisson bucket. Okay? Well, this is always a, 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 a good point because an evolution in time is described by derivatives that do not involve time. Okay? They, uh, in, in any point of the phase space, given a, a dynamical uh, function, you know how it, it evolves. This is important. And then you can also express the Taylor expansion in time as a series of Poisson markets. Okay? Then you express formally this expression. Okay. like the exponential of an operator, and that operator is the integrator. Okay. So, formally, you can uh, define the evolution in time, here I must say time one, okay. the evolution in time of any canonical coordinate, okay. because also And so you can collect all together in this transformation and because of the fact that the Hamiltonian flow induces a canonical transformation, then this is a canonical transformation. Okay? Well, this is 
just a formal approach to introduction, uh, you have to discuss about the convergence of this our series. But okay, I think that you will uh, believe me that if the generating function, so the generating function is the function, the flow of which you are studying, uh, if the generating function is small enough, then this uh, series can converge. And uh, I'm going to make a lot of notes explaining uh, how you can handle with uh, the convergence of uh, these transformations and so on. Okay? But there is another thing that makes this series extremely useful. Well, while this introduction, at least at the formal level, is very simple, you have to, to work a bit more in order to prove the exchange theorem. Okay. The exchange theorem says to you that, okay, then you have a way to introduce canonical transformations by the series while they are very happy. But usually what you have to do, okay, you have to express the Hamiltonian in the coordinates. So formally, what you have to, to do is on the left hand side of the equation appearing there. So you have instead of F Hamiltonian, okay, well you compute the change of coordinates for all the coordinates, and then you replace the, the new expression of the canonical coordinates in the Hamiltonian, and you have the new Hamiltonian in the new canonical coordinates, and you are happy, okay? But this is quite cumbersome, and the exchange theorem uh, ensures to you that you can apply directly the this series to the Hamiltonian. And then, as uh, Antonio told us many times, while well, canonical coordinates you use to express the Hamiltonian are dummy variables. So at the end, uh, you want the expression of the Hamiltonian in capital P, capital Q coordinates, then just replace. Well, <clears throat> I rephrase this, this sentence about dummy variables, uh, saying that well, what is really interesting to us is the functional loop expressing Hamiltonian. Okay, this does not depend, of course, on the name of the variables, and then at the end you can replace them when you want, because with this procedure you have computed. The functional law satisfied by the new Hamiltonian. Okay? Well, this is extremely useful. Okay? Remember that, well, in order to study the dynamics, you focus on Hamilton equation. And if you have a problem with many degrees of freedom, okay, in order to do what is prescribed. On the left hand side, you have to replace the coordinates to four possibilities. A lot of entries, so for two times the number of degrees of freedom. Instead, by applying what is prescribed on the right hand side, you just transform one function. Okay? Because the dynamics is prescribed by just the Newtonian function. This is very complicated. Okay? And this also moves us in the direction of the normal form procedure. Okay, as I used to say, normal form is an empty concept. Okay, but in order to uh, describe the strategy, okay, let me do this skip. Okay, well, suppose that you have 
you're, you're able to express economical transformation such that the new Hamiltonian is easily integrable. Easily means that, okay, since the new Hamiltonian is integrable by mathematical definition, also the old one is integrable. Okay? But, okay, in, in this new Hamiltonian, you solve the, the equation of motion very quickly. Okay? Let me translate uh, this procedure in uh, a, a famous sentence. Sentence that is very famous in this town. So, say you know, a avesse the water, it was a second car. So, it's a, a sort of uh, idealistic assumption that probably <coughs> you, you can't fulfill. But okay, let's go on. Then, in this case, you can apply this scheme in order to integrate the equation. So, you go in the normalized form in the sense that, okay, they are associated to the normal form you like. It is just something you like. You compute the flow here, and because of the fact that canonical transformation preserves motion law, okay, then you can move back to the original coordinates after some time, and this is the solution after time t. Okay? Well, so, Let's try to apply <coughs> this scheme at least in a naive way to a simple system. And in my opinion, and also, and also because uh, 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 Antonio explained us uh, the normal forms in the context of the Birkhoff normal form of the Birkhoff normalization for a system of so-called non-linear oscillators. So uh, it means that you can express your Hamiltonian by a main quadratic part that is made by uh, <coughs> among oscillators and uh, the, uh, the number of degrees of freedom is always n and so you have n angular velocities uh, omega or, or omega j rather okay and uh, you have perturbations of uh, total polynomial degree in the moment that is higher than 2. Well, I used uh, to, to do this sort of scheme, uh, so it, it's a very strange way to, to, <coughs> to break down an Hamiltonian, but it is in order to stress that going in that direction, okay, to the right, tends a thought to be smaller and smaller. And going in that direction vertically, well, the degree in action is smaller and smaller. Why the degree in action? Because it is comfortable to introduce uh, the uh, action angle coordinates that are usually called the harmonica, the harmonic oscillator. Okay, and then you have this part that you consider the main one in the sense that, of course, if you stay close to the equilibrium form, and you have a trivial equilibrium form corresponding to C and eta uh, on the only coordinates equal to zero, that is equivalent to action actions equal to zero. So if you have a, a, a trivial solution, if the vector omega is uh, <clears throat> made by entries uh, with uh, positive signs, 
then um, uh, the, the, the diamond is a lot very complex, and then you are sure that you remove that. Okay, what you, you stay close to the origin. Okay, so close enough to the origin when you increase the action. Okay, since the action is small close to the origin, then this term is smaller than this, and so on by increasing the uh, <coughs> the uh, degree, the total degree in this direction. Actually, it is the total degree in the square root of the action. And uh, we shift a bit the indexes in order to have uh, that, okay, with index one, you are referring to a term that is cubic in the square root of the actions. Uh, with index 2, you are referring to a term that is uh, quartic in the square root of the actions and so on. Okay? Well, then you say, okay, we have a, a nice tool and uh, you understand that actions are good, angles are bad, so you try to eliminate angles, okay? And you do that by this uh, uh, transformation. Well, maybe the transformation is not yet written, but okay. You compute a generic, a, a, a generic in function in order to. Um, Solve the first equations you see on the top. Okay. This is called homological equation. Actually, well, the, the name is a bit outside the context because, as far as I know, the term has been introduced by Arnold, by Arnold so at the effort of the KM theorem, while uh, the Birkhoff normal form is for. We will see that the equation is very, very similar. Then, okay, imagine to express the cubic term with respect to the, uh, <coughs> uh, to the uh, square root of the action, okay? Um, expand it, and then, in order to solve that equation, you see, well, it is very easy. It is just a matter to introduce a divisor, okay, where you have uh, a, a scalar order between the angular velocities and the Fourier harmonic of the term you want to read. Of course, if the that harmonic is zero, so it means that if the term you are considering has angular average that is equal to zero, so it is not this dependence on zero, then you cannot remove that term carefully, because otherwise your divisor would be zero. Okay? And then, well, uh, as you see, in the definition of the homological equation, you just put this kind of terms, okay, in the right-hand side of the equation because you don't need it. So in mathematical terms, this is a sort of kernel of the operator associated to the solution of the homological equation. Okay. Well, then. After having computed the, the solution of uh, uh, the homological equation, you apply okay, the Lee series relating to that um, generating function to the previous solution. So let's mark the difference. Here you have a term that is dependent on the angle. These series are uh, linear uh, operator, so you can apply these series separately to each term. Okay. 
Then when you apply delicious to that term, what is the very first uh, the very first term of the D series corresponding to the uh, index J equal to zero is the identity. Okay? And the second one corresponding to J equal to one is nothing but uh, the Lie derivative applied to the argument. So if the, the first term is the identity, so you can you recreate just this term, and the second term is nothing but the equation bracket between uh, the linear term and the generic function. And this remove, this sum up with this, and this remove the uh, angular dependence term. So it disappears. Actually, uh, in this case, uh, you have not uh, any term that is uh, cubic in the square root of the actions and as angular average that is equal to zero, and this is due to the relations you have in the expansion. Okay. But it is a quite involved way to, to express all the coefficients, but this is just to, uh, um, to stress the fact that um, you cannot have uh, uh, a completely free expansion that uh, unrelates the dependency on the actions with the dependency on the actors because they are um, sorry, they are uh, uh, coming from an expansion in polynomial coordinates. Well, you do this Ah, and of course, you generate also terms, okay, that are, okay, the first one is cubic, the second one is quartic, and then quintic, and so on and so forth. So they sum up to other terms, okay, and then also if you apply the this series to this term, okay, uh, well, you have a first contribution that is the identity, so it recreates that term. Then you have the contribution adding up to the quartic terms and so on and so forth. So it is just a matter to compute or to uh, easily evaluate the uh, total degree in the square root of the actions of any Poisson bucket to know how to gather all the terms generated by the series. Okay? And then you express the new Hamiltonian and you do the same in order to remove the uh, angular dependency. Okay? But this is, has nothing to do with the um, theorem, but it is the Simplest way to understand uh, the procedure of the uh, normal forms. So let me mention that I was able to teach uh, this method with uh, classes in, uh, in the PC classroom uh, by using Mathematica as an algebraic manipulator in order to perform the construction of Dirk of normal form starting from the Newton today classified Newton. So that is carrying the students at the level of the master degree in mathematics have digested in regards to many problems. Okay. 
okay? Then you do the same also for the quantum term. And in principle, you can go over it, okay? Let me stress another thing. All these expansions for the fixed term are finite. Okay? And this is another key point in order to represent them on the fixed term. Well, so in principle, if uh, your uh, mm, quasi periodic angular velocities uh, describing the approximation, the quadratic approximation of the harmonic oscillators are not resonant enough, then you can perform this construction as far as the demand. Okay? In principle, but it is very well known that if you try to perform infinitely many times this procedure, you uh, will define a, an Hamiltonian that is converging on a on set with a radius of convergence that is equal to zero. And this is quite obvious if you think to the uh, theorem by Poincare on the non-existence of first integrals. Okay? This is a, a theorem that is uh, holding true in, under generic conditions. So if this procedure that is generic as well would converge on a set with a radius, with a positive radius. So it would be an example of a generic Hamiltonian that is integrated and is in opposition with the uh, result of Poincare. Anyway, nobody is obliging you to perform this procedure up to infinity. Okay? So, what is comfortable to, to do is to stop this procedure at an optimal uh, normalization step. Okay? And optimal means that, okay, uh, probably you are investing in some very precise problem. Okay, with some initial conditions. Those initial conditions have a distance from your equilibrium point. So try to minimize the remainder, okay, the remainder is written uh, top, the remainder of the electronormal form. It means the part that is still depending on the actions, okay? Why the part that is depending, uh, still depending on the angles too? Why the part that is depending just on the actions, it is usually called the normal form part of the vehicle normal form, okay? Well, try to minimize that and you will, <coughs> you will be able to obtain this nice result. It means that the remainder is going to zero exponentially fast with respect to the distance from the uh, equilibrium point. Okay? So if you approach more and more the equilibrium point, the remainder is smaller and smaller. And so you are able to construct an approximation as good as you want. By approaching the equilibrium point. Okay? Well, what is a bit less known is that uh, when we try to apply um, the results on these kind of exponential estimates, uh, usually called the Wilson correlation estimates, uh, to uh, some uh, uh, interesting problem in celestial mechanics. Well, we have always obtained results that are less performing with respect to 
those were stained uh, by a white hair. And to me, uh, one of the main drawbacks of the birth of normal form is that, okay, you ensure your stability result on a ball centered about the equilibrium point on all the points, okay? And, well, here, yeah, this key, that the radius of convergence is revealed, again, let me repeat, uh, by the distance in action from the equilibrium point, okay? While, when you try to plot the motion in actions for rather stable situation, okay, you see that the motion in, in, in actions will be very localized in some spots, okay? So it is pointless to have a too good result covering a large area. You are interested usually in application to uh, results holding in a small portion of the face space, a small portion for what concerns the set of the action. Okay, so well, let's move to uh, another result of the same field that satisfies this requirement. Okay, so to be valid locally uh, around. Uh, some values of the actions. Okay? Well, again, let me express the Hamiltonian in this form. Again, if we move in this direction, the size of the terms are getting smaller and smaller. And if you move in that direction vertically, the total degree in, uh, in actions is increasing more and more. And why you are expecting that uh, moving in that direction the terms are smaller? Well, it is because of the fact that you assume analyticity. Okay? So, since the functions are analytic, then uh, because of the uh, Fourier decay, the terms are. Uh, decreasing more and more by increasing the order of, say, the L1 norm of the uh, amounts or, again, the total degree, the total trigonometric degree associated to the amount. So, here you are splitting the Hamiltonian in blocks that have uh, for instance, in this example, uh, that are linear in the actions, okay, and of uh, total trigonometric degree in the angles, that is one times an integer two, okay, and this uh, integer capital K is during the decay. Uh, remark that uh, I've made uh, epsilon to disappear because uh, actually it is reabsorbed uh, re in that decay. Uh, okay? And also this was a famous sentence uh, by Antonio, epsilon doesn't count for anything. And let me not translate this sentence in his original version. Okay? Yes. And <coughs> so, another example, this is quadratic in the actions and the total trigonometric degree, so the sum of the absolute values of A components of the Fourier harmonic is S time capital K. Okay? Well, now, what we try to do uh, when we perform the uh, um, so-called Kolmogorov normalization. Well, uh, if you think to the theorem and to the Kolmogorov normal form, it means 
that you uh, you really don't want to have all these terms in the first two columns except the independent ones. Okay? Why? Because in the first two columns you have either terms that are not dependent on directions or terms that are linear in directions. Okay? And you try to remember how by an homological equation. Okay? So the first main term is that. Okay? And you remove it in a very similar way to in a very similar way to what you have done in uh, uh, the real problem normalization. Compare the equation about the fact that here you have a, a, a contribution that is not depending on the angles. And in principle, also here you have a contribution that is not depending on the, uh, on the angles, but since the total degree in action is equal to zero, so it is not depending on the actions as well, and then it is a constant that will sum up to this cell, and this cell is just the energy level corresponding to P equal zero. Okay, well, so you solve this homological equation, how? Write down the Fourier expansion and of, of the term you want to remove and add a denominator, okay, that is uh, k times uh, the angular velocity vector, vector where k is just the uh, Fourier point. Okay? Then you start to apply the least series as, uh, related to that generating function to all the other functions. Okay? So the first contribution is what? Well, you could apply also to the energy, but since it is a constant, and Poisson bracket is that to disappear. So the first contribution uh, um, the Poisson bracket between the generating function and the main linear term, and you will sum up to this, and that way you will have a zero here, okay, plus an energy that you sum up here, and then okay by saying okay uh, the, for instance uh, let's imagine to apply the this series to the quadratic term that is not depending on the angles well you will generate a contribution that will sum up here with the first portion bracket and then you will just by applying two times the Poisson bracket, so the little derivative to that, you sum up and you generate a term that will sum up here. Why? Because the generating function here was meant to remove that term, so it is not depending on the actions. So when you do uh, the Poisson bracket uh, with an argument and a generating function that does not depend on the actions, so you have derivative on the actions, so you take this by one, okay, total degree in action. And then you sum up everything. And it is just a matter to, to uh, calculate the, uh, where you have to place the, the contribution. Okay, so this is a schematic way to say, ah, okay, so here you sum up the two contribution and you uh, you call the, the new term in that way, okay, and you do that 
for every term appearing in the expansion. So in that way, you calculate the new expansion of the Hamiltonian you obtain by applying the DC equivalent. Okay? And uh, we are used uh, to map different paths, okay, the, uh, the terms appearing in the expression after this half step of the uh, cosmological manipulation. Okay? Well, then you want to remove all the two columns, okay? You will record that going in that direction, the terms are smaller and smaller. So uh, the next term to remove is this one. Okay? And then you apply a, uh, no, a you um, compute another harmonical equation. So to remove that term. Okay? Here you have again a contribution that is not depending on the angles, okay? And this time it will be linear in the angles. So you cannot remove this, okay? And uh, well, it, it will appear in the expansion for a while, okay? And then you do the same for construction. So compute the homological equation, apply to that, so the first term will remove the angular dependence here, okay, and then this is the new computed term, and then you do the same for all the contributions, by recalling that the DC is a, is a linear operator, and so it is just matter, again, to understand, well, for instance, if you apply a Poisson bracket with that quadratic and the integral term, the first term is the identity, the second one will sum up there, the third one will sum up there, and so on and so forth, because now the generating function is linear in the actions. So when you apply it by Poisson bracket, you will preserve the total degree. And then you can compute the new expression of the Hamiltonian after this canonical, uh, <coughs> canonical transformation expressed by this. These two steps summarize these two steps summarize the uh, um, so-called Kolmogorov normalization, okay? And here uh, there is a, a small variation with respect to the original scheme. I'm not going to remove that term, okay? And it is possible to remove that term by translation. So by requiring that this is non-degenerate, okay? Well, I don't want to do that for some reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons is that in the applications I show you, well, uh, you have not a very precise information about the angular velocity. Angular velocities are uh, uh, associated uh, to the orbital elements, but orbital elements are known with some uncertainty. And you want to uh, set a normalization procedure that allows to you to consider a bunch of Hamiltonians. Okay, at the same time. So that way you don't know exactly the, uh, the angular velocities. So you don't know exactly which topos you are targeting. Okay? So that way 
hyperparameter of two hour lines. Okay? Well, this was not that because it, it doesn't lie. And also, it will be very useful for the electric torah, okay? And this was 80s, even more, but okay, this is another point, okay? So, uh, what I've done of this term is, okay, it, uh, it does not depend on the numbers. It is linear in functions, so it is exactly the same form of this. Just let me just reabsorb that by updating a bit the angular process. Okay? And as you probably have seen, the first index on the top is always referring to the number of normalization steps. Then you uh, easily realize that probably you have to do the same also for all the other terms. So you remove this by an homological equation, absorbing the homological equation, and by applying the E series with that generating function. And then this, and then so on and so forth. So if you are lucky, Uh, you, you will arrive in that way, so you are able to remove all these terms, okay? And then you are in the column of normalization, okay? Lucky here means that, okay, Anytime you solve an homological equation, you, uh, <coughs> you put a denominator there, okay? So lucky means that all the denominators you introduce never match, okay? They are uh, moving a bit here, but by the time are uh, occupying most of the uh, of the <coughs> uh, real vectors, so we hope that this can happen, and lucky means also that the perturbations are small enough to let all the procedure converge. Okay, so actually. But it is important to know the statements relating to every procedure you want to set up. And by using this procedure, you can prove a theorem like that. And the statement is uh, reported in an article by Kirchner, okay, that was about electric torrents. But in the introduction, uh, an easy uh, adaptation of this result to the, the classical Keynesian, he formulated that statement. Okay? Well, what was astonishing to me is that not only the no resonance condition here has disappeared, but also the non degeneracy. Why? Because the non-degeneracy in the correspondence between actions and frequencies in the integrable approximation is used to arrive to an expansion of the Hamiltonian like that, that you see on top. Okay? So, and the expansion is, okay, you have your term you like so much, so the, the, the part that is linear will depend in the, in the actions and it is not dependent on the actions. 
plus in a way a perturbation. Okay, that is either of degree zero in the action or of degree one in the action. Okay, plus half depends, it's not half, it's H of D. Uh, that means either of either of the terms, okay, with respect to the action. Okay. And well, if you have non-degeneracy, you can arrive from expressions like that. And you can label a tangent of any points with respect, if you want, to some various actions, or in this case it is more complicated. To label it with respect to the angular velocity appearing in the first term. So it means the angular velocity corresponding to the invariant cause t equal to zero in the integrable approximation, in the integrable approximation without the terms in red. Okay? Well, then. Then, uh, well, this is uh, an assumption about the form uh, of the terms you have. And if the perturbation is small enough, then well, you are sure that for a set of uh, angular velocities uh, that is large in measure, Positive level energy, large in the sense that the epsilon is equal to zero. This set uh, that is marked with the upper index infinity is going to the full set. It's going uh, to the full original set of angular velocities. Then, for each of uh, <coughs> The frequencies that are there, okay, frequencies and angular velocities are made, uh, the, the same concept. Uh, for each uh, angular velocity in this new set, okay, there exists a non transformation marking you to the um, Kolmogorov normal form, or let me rephrase. Uh, for each of these angular velocity, uh, velocities, your uh, uh, procedure is converging to the Kolmogorov number. Okay? Again, about the complexity of this uh, algorithm, well, I've uh, <coughs> uh, assigned as uh, a part of the exam to the course I took you before, uh, to assume a construction of the Kolmogorov normal form for an easy quadratic Hamiltonian with two degrees of freedom and the freedom association. Okay, using mathematics as a simple and user friendly algebraic model. So these kind of things. Okay. Well, so what about the non resonance condition? Uh, you recover the non resonance condition in the final set you obtain, in the sense that, okay, well, in general, not the original uh, angular velocities are diophantic. Okay. But the angular velocities you obtain by updating at each step the values of the angular velocities, including the angular average, okay, while well, this uh, uh, sequence of angular velocities will converge to a diophantic in the sense that with the value of time you can uh, with the value of you can ensure the okay? Okay.
Okay. Well, now let's go to elliptic torah. Why? Uh, this is not making part of Bayesian theorem, in, uh, uh, strictly speaking, but in my opinion, uh, they are a keystone for designing new application in selection. So let me uh, enter also this. Well, you just complicate the bit your amino. Okay. Here you have actions and labels. Okay. Here you have also some so-called transverse degrees of freedom. Transverse in the sense that they are transverse to the environment cause the final thing. Okay. And they are described by polynomial quotients. It's a well, again, uh, let us assume that you are able to uh, obtain, or you are considering, a family of Hamiltonian labeled by the angular velocities, omega naught, that appear in the main term, plus harmonic transform oscillators in the transverse directions. Okay. Plus terms in red, they don't lie, because the total degree in the square root of the total actions is either 0 or 1 or 2. Well, uh, before we add total degree in the square root of actions that were 0 or 1, and these terms you don't like because you want to remove. Uh, well, in the square root of action, it was 0 and 2. But actually, there was not same of the uh, powers in the actions. Here, they were in the sense that, okay, if you introduce action angle coordinates uh, related to transverse motion, then, okay, uh, uh, then you have also. Uh, powers in the square root of the transverse action. Okay? Plus our uh, higher order terms. Okay? Then, if epsilon is a parameter small enough, okay, and then the thesis, well, there is again a set of uh, um, <coughs> initial values of uh, the angular velocities such that if the perturbation is small enough then uh, there is a canonical transformation uh, going to uh, well leaving the Hamiltonian to a Kolmogorov of like normal form. It means that okay you have again a linear term in the actions plus the, the part that is transverse, that is described by uh, <coughs> uh, harmonic oscillators, plus terms that are at least cubic in the square root of actions. Okay. Well, this is a famous video, and as far as I know, I've seen the first time in one of the papers uh, by Arnold of 63, okay? And uh, it is reported also in the Encyclopedia of Elemental Systems. And uh, so in order to understand uh, what we are uh, work, uh, talking about, uh, this is a scheme of a surface of section of a quasi-integrable system, of a quasi-integrable system, so this uh, circles are invariant to I. Here you have uh, uh, hyperbolic points uh, with uh, chaos, stripping of the parameters and so on and so forth. Here you have chains of resonant ions and elliptic to in this example, are, for instance, uh, well, located by. 
by these points at the very center of the personal balance. So I will try and study also uh, the dynamics around, okay, around uh, well, inside the uh, resonance, so resonance theory. Okay? Well, uh, why this form? Because if you try to solve the uh, Hamilton equation for this normal form, you immediately realize that when capital T, so uh, yeah, the normalized action and uh, the normalized transverse coordinates are equal to zero, then you obtain that uh, that surface is invariant is a torus of dimension n1, okay? And n2 is the number of degrees of freedom that are transverse, okay? And it is invariant and it is traveled by quasi-periodic motions, okay? Or described by an angular velocity vector that is of dimension n1, okay? So you have the Cartesian of this that is invariant. This is invariant in action angle coordinates and this is invariant in the transfer uh, polynomial coefficients. Okay? Well, and uh, how to do that? So, how to uh, try to, to prove this theorem? Well, you, you do the same kind of normalization. Uh, remember before a single normalization step according to Golden Law was made by two canonical transformations. Now we do that by three canonical transformations. And why? Because you want to remove now terms that are in the first three columns, uh, three rows. Why? because you want to remove terms that uh, do not depend on actions, that depend on the square root of actions, that depend on the square root of actions to the power 2. Okay? Well, and so you, you do the same. You solve uh, a homological equation, in order to remove this term, you apply a series and uh, you do the same in order to apply this. And remember that here there is a part that is not depending on the angles and not on the actions. And then uh, it is a constant and you update the energy. It's and you remove this, but here you have a contribution that you can't eliminate, and then again you have to update the forces. Okay. And if you are lucky, you will be able to your procedure up to the final Kolmogorov like normal form, quality of this Okay? And this is actually ensured by the theorem by Cushing. Actually, well, in order to prove the, 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 the final part which is about the, the measure of the self tori, well, the, the, the this uh, geometrical part is quite tricky, but okay. Let me not end to this, because what I want to extract again from here is the procedure. And this is the information that if, uh, uh, if the perturbation is small enough, this procedure can lead you to the construction of a normal form corresponding to an elliptic. Okay, and uh, a, a remark about the homological equation. Well, uh, here you have an example, and mind the fact that 
when you solve this homological equation, you have a denominator mixing up. Okay? The angular velocities related to the invariant torus and the angular velocities describing the limit of small oscillations transfers to that invariant torus. Okay? So, well, I said before that I, uh, <coughs> I modified a bit uh, the um, original Kolmogorov of algorithm, skipping the translation. Okay? And uh, actually, here we are really forced to do that. Why? Because translations are translations in actions. Okay, here actions indeed, okay, have dimension n1 that is more than the total number of degree equivalent. Okay, so in order to try to follow a torus associated to a specific angular velocity, we would also have parameters to follow uh, the, um, angular frequent, the angular velocities that are transverse, but you have not this parameter. So you have lack of uh, parameters during the translation you could implement in the script. So you have not enough parameters to, to, to really well the translation, so you skip the translation. Okay? And so well, this was just to say that uh, <coughs> let the angular frequencies move a bit from a normalization step to another is somehow mandatory with the elliptical action. Okay. But in case of would not agree. Okay, so the non-resonance condition you have in order to ensure that all the denominators are different from zero, okay, is like that. Okay, this is a sort of uh, mixed condition. Let's see again the part about the angular velocities on the torus and the part about the transverse oscillations, okay? And uh, so when uh, L equal, is equal to zero, you have the uh, usual Bayer-Thompson condition. When L is equal to one or L is equal to two, then you have the so-called mixed conditions, uh, uh, manifold conditions, And let me consider this example. So you have one degree of freedom for your environment torus, your time and environment elliptic torus, and one uh, degree of freedom for the transverse oscillation. Then, okay, uh, the uh, harmonics you have can be expressed in this form. This is for K, and this is for L. Okay, and then uh, you have another one, another grid. Okay, 
Okay, so you have small divisors when uh, your uh, um, your grid okay, of modules in mathematical terms uh, is approaching the normal direction with respect to the angle of the Okay, so mind the fact yeah, I'm, uh, I'm skipping the case with the L equal 2 and L equal minus 2, but it should be rather clear that in principle uh, the divisors cannot be arbitrarily small. Okay, because if that direction is not uh, or exactly passing close uh, uh, one of these points in the grid, okay, then uh, you could approach more and more this direction if you had an infinite grid also in the practical direction. And this is the case of the KM theorem in the classical sense. For the elliptic for uh, I, then it can happen to you, and in particular this happens when you are considered when you are considering the elliptic tori of dimension one for work on some triangular motion. Well it can happen to you that uh, the small divisors entering in the solution of the homological equations are uh, limited from below uh, by a constant, different constant. So you can realize that the elliptic tori are extremely robust. Then, well, uh, we'll see in a moment an application of this concept. Okay, now I ended the, the part, say, about uh, uh, an introduction to uh, KM theory, and uh, let me show some applications to extrasolar systems. So, <clears throat> well, let me include that. There are uh, two main ways to detect uh, planets in extrasolar system. One is about the uh, uh, one is using the radial velocity, and it is a measure uh, uh, exploiting the Doppler effect. So it means that if the star is moving uh, towards us, then uh, the frequency of the light is larger. If it's going uh, in, in the opposite direction, then the frequency of the light is uh, lower. Okay. And uh, you, you, that way you don't uh, see directly the planets, you're just stunning the fact that because of the preservation of Center, okay, since the planet is moving, also the star must shake up the planet. Okay, and uh, otherwise, uh, you have as a very beautiful method the, the transit, but we like much better the radial velocity uh, method because it is able to detect planets with larger masses. Okay that maybe are not so close to, to the star, but in order to, to have an idea of the mean skeleton of an extrasolar system, well, you are interested in to know the bigger guys there. Okay. Well, so, <clears throat> now let me comment, uh, finally, the one 
1% of inspiration we put in the game. Okay? Perturbation theory is 1% of inspiration and 99% of transpiration. Okay? And uh, actually, I don't remember who mentioned that sentence, maybe it was fun, about uh, theoretical physics. Uh, okay, and so, uh, um, another another remark. Uh, <coughs> well, there is another very interesting characteristic of this uh, system, and it is the fact that inclinations cannot be directly detected, and so uh, what you measure is not the mass, but the mass times sine time of the unknown inclination. Okay. Then you have systems depending on an unknown parameter. So it is really a lot of fun for people uh, like in uh, theory. Okay. And then okay, uh, we, we try to apply a so-called reverse schema approach in the sense that usually in our solar systems, we were uh, used to say, okay, we have initial conditions that we know in principle very well, and uh, we compute the corresponding number of processes, and we try to construct the care those uh, related to those angular velocities. Okay, here is the reverse situation. You don't know exactly the initial condition. So you don't know exactly uh, <coughs> the, uh, the angular frequencies and the n torus that could describe the system. Okay. But you, you assume that either you are extremely lucky or if you are able to observe the system, probably, well, it has some stability problem. Because, okay, uh, otherwise, you, you see the, a, a specific system just in that century is living. Okay, and well, this is quite unprobable for our life. Okay, so uh, you, you, you put is procedure on the reverse. So you try to uh, understand which kind of inclinations are fitting with the uh, stability properties ensured by the KM. Okay? So, well, you, you try to, to do that on the reverse is it the idea, and there are pros and cons, and in the process um, uh, uh, <coughs> mentioned the speed, so first because we will, uh, uh, we will uh, consider a secular problem, so after the averaging on the fast tempers, so you decrease the number of degrees of freedom, and you could say, ah, you are cheating, yeah, but actually, fast angles are unknown at all. So, uh, if you try to integrate the complete system, okay, you have to put data uh, just by chance, and you are trying to, to, to say, well, these specific values of the angular uh, of the mean motion angles are describing quite well uh, generic uh, properties. While uh, thinking on the secular problem is the natural way to approach a problem like that, where you assume that the mean motion angle should not play a prominent role. Okay, and. Uh, well, uh, you can also use interval arithmetics to describe uh, bunches of uh, 
uh, of uh, a new commons parameterizer with respect to the definition of discrimination. You can uh, put the procedure on uh, uh, a multi core computer and so on and so forth. But as we will see, probably we are far from obtaining the results that are uh, covering everything is showed by a pure numerical procedure. Okay, well, this is a short summary of the procedure I employ in the world because there are many doors again to comment. Okay, so uh, you You can uh, describe a free body problem, why free body? Well, let's start with free body. Okay, two bodies trivial, uh, and then uh, free body is the first non trivial system. Okay, and uh, you have a Keplerian part plus a perturbation that is due to the mutual uh, attraction between the planets. Okay. You use uh, uh, <coughs> these uh, coordinates that are coming from the uh, use of the only coordinates. This is the version by Poincaré, actually. Uh, well, um, on top, you have the so called fast coordinates. Well, actually, just the angles are, have uh, uh, fast foundations. Uh, the actions are very stable in general. Um, and, uh, okay, and C and beta are the um, coordinates used to describe uh, the motion of the eccentricity, this it is, and the uh, argument of the periodia. Okay, and uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the traditional symbol is omega as well. Okay, well, uh, what about what about uh, the inclinations? Well, uh, inclinations are we are reabsorbed by the fact that uh, we remove. Uh, two degrees of freedom related uh, to the uh, constant of motion. Uh, uh, actually, there are five constants of motion that are in evolution. Three of them are the uh, total linear momentum, and uh, two of them are the direction of the total angular momentum and the uh, norm of the total angular momentum. So, uh, uh, since at the beginning the number of degrees of freedom are nine, uh, out of this reduction, nine minus five, uh, minus five, and you apply to a, a system with four degrees of freedom, and so these coordinates are enough. And uh, well, after these classical expansions, you perform the average with respect to, uh, to the fast angles, because you assume that, OK, in order to study the long time, uh, long time stability, what is really, what really matters uh, is due to the degrees of freedom that has a secular evolution. Okay, then you go down with an expression like that, so uh, because you remove the other two degrees of freedom related to the to the fast angles. So you have a Hamiltonian with two degrees of freedom that is describing the Secular vectors, okay? And because of the famous number rules, okay, uh, that Hamiltonian is expressed by an expansion of polynomial terms that 
this E. Okay. So this means, as a unity, uh, a useful sequence, that uh, the solution corresponding to Z and eta equal to zero. So zero eccentricities, and let me say also zero dimensions. So the case of Coplanar motions with the circular Keplerian, Keplerian of this, but this case of the circular mechanism is stable. Okay, so it's a, 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 an equilibrium point and uh, the Newtonian bias functions. Okay, but then we use, ah, nice, so we have learned that we can apply the of normalization to that. And then you do it, okay? Well, why up to the V6? This is for historical reason, and it is uh, convenient for the scientific exact system. You could admit the number of normalization steps you do by virtual, by the virtual procedure, but actually, as I, I have explained, I have tried to explain together, well, the historical reason is that uh, the birth of normal form was expected to be mandatory in order to ensure the non degeneracy of the correspondence between action, actions and angular velocities. But this was more than 50 years ago. Now we have understood that we can put the problem in a way that actually, if you put the problem that way, afterwards the normalization procedure does not require any non degeneracy assumption. So, this is a way to understand that probably the act of normal form is not necessary at all. I explore this on my chapter. Then you shift the origin. Okay, and then you do the KM procedure of normalization. Let me go on. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, actually, the expansions are expressed like that, um, where there is also the dependency of this famous parameter D2, according to the notation introduced by the scanner. And the two is a sort of angular momentum energy. What does it mean? Well, it means that uh, capital lambda one and capital lambda two are the fast actions. And the fast actions are the, uh, the norm of the angular momentum if uh, the orbit is circular. Okay, and uh, uh, in that case, uh, the two is equal to zero if uh, both the orbits are circular and compact. Okay, because in that way, uh, lambda one plus capital lambda one plus capital lambda two are nothing but the total angular momentum, so capital C. Okay, so deficit is. Should fill in order to have circular points. Okay, eccentricities describe actually this deficit. Okay, uh, as much uh, as uh, you miss angular momentum, as more the orbits are eccentric. Okay, and well, what about inclinations? Inclinations uh, can be computed uh, by uh, D2 and uh, the action angle variables uh, related to the secular variables. Okay? And D2 is uh, in the secular dynamics a conference of energy. So, well, if you uh, describe Z and eta, so the motion of Z and eta, you can also recover the motion of the mutual inclination. So this is a consequence of that. So this 
that uh, an actual say that we are not losing anything if we consider this. Okay? Then we describe the Hamiltonian, uh, the starting Hamiltonian, in uh, that way. It means that, ah, okay, D2 is a order of the square of the eccentricity or a order of the square of the information. Okay, and since uh, the, the actions connected to Z and eta are of order of the eccentricity in the square, okay, uh, well, uh, so here you have uh, terms that are of degree 2 in the uh, uh, in the actions, so it means that are of degree four in the actions, and here you have terms that are of degree one in the actions and of degree one in D two, and so since D two is uh, of the same order of the eccentricity, also these are terms in the order four in the eccentricities, and eccentricities are expected to be small. For the systems we are considering. So we start with the field of normalization here, and uh, we pass from here to uh, the dependence on the angle here and the angle here. So you have an integrable approximation up to the degree 6, up to the order 6 in the Okay? Then you shift the action. Why? Because you are starting with the big, the total you want to, to, to construct, okay, but, but you don't know exactly uh, the angular velocities, so you are very uh, pragmatic, you will try to go as far as possible from the equilibrium point. Means that you are trying to consider systems that are more and more eccentric or more and more inclined. Okay? And you, uh, after this shift, okay, remind, remind the fact that here you have uh, also powers in the square root of the actions. So when you uh, do a translation here, you generate an infinite series in the actions, so you lose the relation uh, coupling the, the actions and the angles, okay? That, were, uh, uh, that was a consequence of the fact that, okay, you are, um, you start from a problem that is expressed in polynomial coordinates, then you make an action of the coordinates. Then you are right. That, and you apply the polynomial normalization. Okay? And now the translation of the one percent of inspiration we had. So it is okay. Let's try to perform this. Okay. Well, actually there was a dependence on the parameter D2, and here it, uh, it was a parameter. Then we replace D2 with intervals of the values of D2. And, okay, uh, well, we tried uh, to um, perform the construction for values of D2 larger and larger and, say, consider a, a, a fixed interval of values. And we look if the construction is convergent or not. Why this kind of, uh, of plot? Well, it is very simple. Here you have the norm of the largest You see, you can Here you have a, a, a lattice that is geometrical in uh, uh, according to what is prescribed by the KL procedure, why? 
because here you have the norm of the uh, generating function in a semi-log uh, uh, plot, and here you have the normalization step. So in a semi-log uh, um, plot, the uh, decrease, the geometrical decrease is bounded by a, uh, a line. Okay? Well, if you have a situation like that, you okay, the procedure is converging. So this step of D2 that is related to the inclination is consistent with uh, the um, stability. Okay? Well, and we succeeded in applying the procedure to three systems. Okay? And uh, so here you have the true false uh, plot. It means that, okay, for these values of D2, okay, uh, in, uh, the, the algorithm can construct KM dot uh, I and it converges. Okay, here you have the orbital elements, might be eccentricities. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the value of T2, being known the values of the eccentricities and then being known the values of the eccentricities, well, you can compute the corresponding mutual inclination. Okay? And we are that this is an alliance, it means that you are right to have to a mutual inclination that is a case of the case. Okay? Mind you, it's impossible. Okay? We succeed also in this. Succeed anymore. Why? Because apparently for this scheme, uh, eccentricity is greater than 0 0.1 is a sort of vanilla. Okay? And you can do not care about that if you focus just on our planetary <coughs> system. Okay? Because well, apart from Mercury, all the other planets have eccentricity. Smaller than 0.1. Okay. Uh, but uh, it seems that uh, other eccentric systems are quite uh, uh, usual uh, to meet in, uh, in extrasolar systems. So we have to change it. Why eccentricities are a problem? Well, because uh, remember that actions are. Proportional to the eccentricity to the power of 2. Okay? So, in increasing the eccentricity, you are moving further from the equilibrium point. And therefore, normal shapes converge well when you are close to the equilibrium point. So, you must change the scheme. So, and another 1% of this. And it's condensed in this slide. Okay, well, so uh, how to move farther from the equilibrium point? Okay, if you uh, if your eccentricity is larger, then also your secular energy is larger. Okay, then it could be very promising to apply. A, an approach based on elliptic polarity. Why? Because yeah, make the computation for the beta model. The beta model is a, a quartic system described by a quartic polynomial without cubic terms. So it is exactly the same kind of uh, structure of the secular problem. And uh, she was able to follow uh, with the construction of the uh, <coughs> of the uh, elliptic tori uh, the curve we obtained by numerical methods up to 93% of the uh, say breakdown pressure of the energy. Okay, so it is a quite performing system. Then. Okay, but let's try to do Okay. In red, you have a, a real uh, motion in the secular dynamics. Okay. You tag 
get an elliptic torus that is inside there, that is uh, located by a numerical method, you construct the elliptic torus uh, corresponding to that uh, to that point, okay, uh, to that point in the surface of section. Then uh, uh, and uh, so you arrive to this level of energy and also to this level of perturbation. Then, by the further translation, you try to construct the torus here. And uh, it is convenient to, to consider these coordinates where you have uh, Z and eta that are described, not like the angle corresponding to that, they are describing the angles, uh, the angle between the pericenters. Okay? And then the fourth slide I can, I could show in one minute if the computer was faster. Uh, well, this is the surface of section corresponding to an angle uh, uh, equal to uh, a, um, a perihelional uh, angle equal to zero. This is the plot of the eccentricities, and this is the plot of the difference of the pericenters. So you look that, okay, you have a vibration corresponding. Uh, a vibration around to the entire alignment of the pericenters. Okay? So the pericenters are moving more or less like that. Okay? And then you have the, the final construction of the environment torus. Okay? Uh, at the end. So uh, the, the, the surface of sections are. Uh, the same, I changed just the, uh, the, the color in order to stress more the, uh, with, the, with the plus sign the curve, curves corresponding to the invariant torus and the elliptic torus. Okay? It's good. It's green and green. And let me show now what is the principle of this. Uh, of so uh, the ideal situation is that the, point, the orbital points are like that, so pointing in the line of sight. Okay, well this would be the case with zero inclination. So we increase the inclination like that. This changes also the mass of the, of the planets. And uh, doing like that, the mutual inclination is just the double of the, uh, the inclinations with respect to the line of sight. Okay, so now you have uh, uh, a mutual inclination that is equal to 4, you succeed in everything. Okay, if you mind the fact, you know, mind this, you see that while well, the norm of the generating function is increasing more and more. It means that, okay, uh, the, system, the, the procedure has more and more difficulties in uh, uh, finding the main torus, but while it succeeds for this system that starts from eccentricities that are, you can look here, at 0. Uh, dot 25 or 0 dot 15, so they are much larger in the system we considered at the beginning. So we are very happy, okay? And now there is 36 degree. Look, that it looks more and more uh, Situation. Okay. At some point, at 30 degrees of mutual inclination, no, at 33 degrees, the procedure fails. Okay. And at the same time, more or less at the same time. Okay. Well, here we 
flow to the, the, uh, the generating function, but they are uh, clearly not converging. Okay, and now at 36 degree, there is a change of structure. Okay, here you have still the vibration. Now you have the rotation around the origin. It means that so uh, your angles are now the difference of the three centers are now rotating. Okay, and I'm very proud that the the uh, the procedure has started to work. So it, it can locate also uh, in a rather precise way the invariant of I with that value of the neutron estimations also for 38, okay? And then for 40, uh, it more or less fails, okay? In 42, it fails, but uh, at the same time, okay, the systems uh, uh, fell down in the currency. So it seems to me that with this approach, uh, we can really so approximate a, a, a rather well realistic phenomenon. Okay, well, uh, I finished. Let me just mention that, in my opinion, what it really means, uh, what really is important is that now in KM theorem you can succeed if you implement in a smart way different normalization procedures. Okay. Actually Antonio started with uh, this approach, uh, Antonio Mosi, by, uh, by uh, linking uh, the Kolmogorov contraction plus Bilecov plus Nekoroshev estimates in order to get the super exponential. And we did something similar, but changing the normal forms we are uh, linking. So it seems that using the normalization for a for I plus the usual KM normalization is a good start. Okay. Thank you. So let us thank you. You are looking for another you are looking for another stadium that you need. And it's your thing. It's not about Polynesia, it's about thing to an argument that is looking to our system. Okay. And well you are not saying this uh, not supposed. Okay. Uh, <coughs> but okay, you probably look from uh, from very far in the world. Well, you, you, will, you could be able to detect the joint functions. Okay. And then, okay, uh, for that, it would be natural to prescribe a standard stability motion. Okay. Because if not, you know that uh, the chaos of the major. Affect your master and your process. So, if you are able by the transit migration, you look also uh, to find also the, the inner practice, okay? Well, you, you must 
Thank you. 